Now, I rolled out a year ago five attributes of future conflict that I believe are going to define the operating environment that we have got to fly, fight, and win in. And what I want to share with you is, is in the year of discussing this, in the year of, of, of working with the Joint Chiefs to build the first classified national military strategy, in a year of working through the joint net assessment of what not only our adversaries are doing, but also where our capabilities and capability gaps are, I've refined my thinking over time. So I've added a sixth. I probably ought to check the math on this slide. <laughs> so I've added a sixth attribute. And so let me, let me share with you where I've come into my thinking. So trans-regional, doggone it, our adversaries are not paying attention to our combatant commander maps. So it's not just General Scaparotti that's thinking about the Russia challenge. It's actually UCOM, AFRICOM, TRANSCOM, SOUTHCOM, NORTHCOM, PACOM, CENTCOM. Every combatant commander comes to work thinking about their role in the Russia challenge set. And so if conflict in the future is going to be trans-regional, that's going to extend beyond the current combatant commander boundaries and maps that we've lived with over time, then the question for us is, as a service that provides global reach and global vision and global power, are we thinking globally? Are we thinking about the game of checkers, or are we providing the commander-in-chief options as chess masters? Because if you were thinking about this in the game of checkers, you would think about linear activity. If you, get me, if you pressure me from the east, then I will counter you from the west. But if you're thinking as a chess master, as a global power, and as a service that operates globally, then perhaps you're thinking about simultaneously you know, pro, you know, providing pressure from the north and the south and the east and the west, and from below the surface, to the highest on the outer reaches of space. And perhaps that defines deterrence in the 21st century because we can create more dilemmas at a faster pace than any of our adversaries can match. Multi-domain is not about one domain supporting another domain. It is about simultaneous warfare. It wasn't that long ago that when we talk about combined arms, it was about either sequential or deconfliction. As an F-117 pilot, I was never going in with anybody else. I was always going out ahead and kicking down the door and preparing the, the environment for follow-on forces. You can even go back to Kosovo and look at the way we orchestrated that campaign, and I would argue that combined arms was deconfliction. Navy go east, Air Force go west, never the two shall meet. But in today's warfare and where we're going in the, in the future, combined arms is about simultaneous activity from all domains that operate together. We sense the globe in six domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber, and undersea. And while not a separate domain, you've almost got to start adding social media to that set. And the question for us is how do we take all of that information from where we sense, from a sensing grid, and actually create the two products that we are required for future warfare, which is a common operational picture that's updated in real time, that actually transitions to decision speed from leaders. So then we can create military effects from those same domains in order to stay ahead of our adversaries. Multi-component. We are far more integrated today than we've ever been. On occasion, we hear discussions, you know, especially in the, in the resource business of a bigger this or a bigger that and grow this and grow that. The reality is, you know what? You can't pull us apart. If you're going to grow one service bigger, you better grow the other one bigger because we're all connected. And simultaneous warfare has become the definition of combined arms. Here's the new one, urban. This comes from a lot of talks in the tank we're having and a lot of talks with my fellow Joint Chiefs, and especially General Neller and General Milley, who are looking at the future of, of, of war on the surface and looking at the demographics. And this is interesting. Right now on our current trajectory, by 2050, 
upwards of 80% of the population of the globe are going to live in cities. And they will grow from a dozen megacities, which we have today, which are over 10 million, a dozen to over 50. And so the high potential for future conflict and combined arms to be more urban than open spaces is something we need to think about as airmen. How do we design an Air Force for that kind of conflict? And I would submit to you that right now, we are probably more designed for operating in open spaces. We are a coalition at the core. And I know we have a number of our coalition partners that are here. And if you think about our strategy, right, it is by, with, and through our allies and partners. And yet information sharing has been, been a, a real struggle for us. Very often because we've got to protect sources and methods. And we've grown up, we've grown up asking a question that may not be the right question for the future of warfare. The question we've been grown up with is, what can I share? How long in that conversation is the answer, nothing, right? I mean, think about this. The youngest airman, the youngest airman, soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, the, but the youngest airman in any of our organizations represented here, through the click of a mouse, can make a decision on the classification of any document that comes across their desk. Secret, no foreign, click, decision. And it takes the oldest member of the organization to reverse that, often through a laborious process that we just give up on. So how do we think about designing an Air Force of the future that's actually coalition at the core, given the fact that our strategy is by, with, and through allies and partners, and given the fact that our asymmetric advantage against the four plus one framework, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, violent extremism, our asymmetric advantage is the fact is that we have allies and they don't. How do we leverage that for the future of warfare? And then we have got to think about speed. We have had a luxury for the last 16 years of controlling the reestablishment of time that is actually unparalleled in the history of warfare. Think about this statement. It's actually fascinating. We are going to retake Mosul in October, announced six months prior. And there's nothing the adversary can do to stop us. We're going to announce ahead of time to the enemy where we're going to go, when we're going to go. That would indicate that we have got total control of the rheostat of time. I do not believe that's going to be true in future warfare. And so we as a service are going to have to adapt to be more agile, more adaptive, more responsive as we look at the future of the warfare. Some may say that this is back to state-on-state -state warfare. We've been on there before. This is, this is sort of back to the Cold War. I would argue actually it's different. The nature of warfare actually doesn't change. It's still a very human activity. But the characteristics of war do change because the ways of war change. So let me just give you an example of how some of this is changing right now. This next chart, if you pull up. So on the left, you see plant four in Fort Worth. This is the B-24 line. At our peak, we put out one B-24 an hour from this line. Oh, by the way, this is the exact same facility today that produces the F-35. So our question for industry in wars of attrition, well, what can it do? And how many can you build? It was about things. But we're transitioning from wars of attrition to wars of cognition. And it forces us to ask different questions of industry. Now we're starting the dialogue with, does it connect? Good. Can it share? Even better. So the last corona I had all the senior leadership team assembled, and I asked them two fundamental questions. 
Who do we need to be in 2030? For Chief 24, who's on the Brigadier General list, who's going to be the chief in 2030, and is going to fight with the force that Secretary Wilson and Chief Goldfein are building, who do we need to be? And perhaps more importantly, what's standing in our way?